This is the world's no man's land, a place where East meets West. Blood feuds, tribal vendettas, and mountain warfare are a way of life in what is called Transcaucasia. Here, these crumbling towers have defeated everyone from Alexander the Great to Attila the Hun and Boris Yeltsin. Hi, I'm David Adams, and my work as a photojournalist takes me to the ends of the earth. Right now, I'm in Georgia, in Tusheti, a land that has never been conquered. But it's also a land of legendary riches, the place where the legendary heroes, Jason and his Argonauts, came in search of the Golden Fleece. I'm sailing off the coast of Georgia, once a republic in the former Soviet Union. And I'm following in the wake of some of the world's first explorers. Two and a half thousand years ago, a boat journeyed to this coastline. Aboard was Jason and his Argonauts. That lighthouse over there marks the mouth of the Rioni River, the waterway they took to enter the land of the legendary Golden Fleece. I'm here to see what lies behind that legend and to discover what Jason would find if he were alive today. My journey starts on the eastern shores of the Black Sea. From here, I go deep into the Caucasus, following the mythical route of the Argonauts until they reach the Caspian Sea. Of course, it was largely imaginary, a myth. According to legend, Jason sailed his ship, the Argo, here to answer a challenge. If he went to a land beyond the ends of the earth and brought back a golden fleece, he would be made a king back home in Greece. So if I'm to follow in his footsteps, I need my own transport, my own version of the Argo. Then, out of the blue, I saw her. She was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. She was blue, she was shiny, she was Russian, but was she for sale? It's for sale? <laughs> Is it a Russian bike? As you can see, the Georgian language is not my strength. How many years? Huh? How many, how many years is it? Ten years old? This conversation was going nowhere, when suddenly and unexpectedly into my life walks the girl who is going to be my guardian angel. Can I help you? Oh, I, I, uh, I know this is for sale, but I, I can't understand what he's saying. How old is the bike? Age, mileage, condition, all seem to be okay, but what about the price? How much does he want? He said 2,000 Georgian lari. Yeah? Yeah. Does it work? Right now, things aren't looking too good. The more he tries to kick life into his elderly machine, the less I'm interested. Will I try? Maybe I can get it better. <laughs> I haven't kick-started a motorbike since the days of my old trail bike back in the Australian bush. And no one's more surprised than me.
But looking at those faces, I'm not quite so sure. Maybe they know something I don't. But I'll risk it. I buy her. Now, all I need is a guide. And maybe, just maybe, I found her too. Meet Ia. Like many Georgians, she's familiar with the legend of the Golden Fleece. So that's where Jason and the Argonauts would have come to? Yes, they um, travelled up to, sailed up to River Rioni, to Kutaisi. But now it's impossible because there are a lot of barriers. I gather they mine gold up in the mountains? Oh, you mean Svaneti? Yes, yeah, Svaneti, yes. Ia seems to know all about the legend. Better still, she's an ethnologist by training. So my yeah, real question is, will she come with me? You know, I'm busy, but what if I will check today? Yeah. I'll call to Tbilisi. OK. There's so many things to do. If you're, if you're brave enough to ride on that bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? So on my 83 Dnieper motorbike and wearing a Russian army helmet, we head north. Yeah. My powers of persuasion work. You know the way? Soon, we're out on the open road, and there's plenty of grunt in this old bike yet. It's summer in Georgia, and it's warm, lush, and green. The trees along the road make it look remarkably European. You wouldn't think you were an Asian miner at all. Soon, we cross the Rioni River, and past the legendary spot where the Argonauts are supposed to have arrived around two and a half thousand years ago. This is Katezi, former capital of the ancient kingdom of Colchis. Colchis was the name the Greeks gave to this part of the world. The name Georgia came later, a corruption of the Arabic, Georgi. Katezi has some rather grandiose buildings, many dating from the Soviet era. But there's one in particular we're looking for, a palace of pleasure for the use of Russian generals and Communist Party members alike. It's been built over a thermal spring, the great Skultbo Spa. Inside, they have a special treat in store for me. A strange mix of bath and torturer's rack. Before they immerse you, they strap you into a special harness with which to stretch you. I have a little bit of a problem because I'm a bit long. Um, obviously, most uh, Russian generals are uh, about three or four inches shorter than me, and now my feet are sticking out, and they probably can't stretch me. While my limbs are being stretched, Ia gets another kind of massage that looks even more like torture. As they say, no pain, no gain. the Soviet hierarchy came from far and wide to wallow in these waters. But the most famous client was also the man who was the guest of honour at its inauguration. The first person to step into these waters was the most infamous of all Georgians, Joseph Stalin. He was the monster that in the 1930s and 40s was responsible for imprisoning and killing millions of people. Who knows what was said and decided right here with his generals and ministers. One of the things they'd have not discussed was Stalin's bodily defects. 
He had a withered arm and two of his toes were supposedly fused together. And while the rich and powerful wallowed at Skulpo, the poor had to make do with the river. A river that was becoming narrower and less navigable for ships like the legendary Argo. Tomorrow, I follow in Jason's footsteps to the place where he got the Golden Fleece. But there may be more to this myth than at first meets the eye. Treat yourself to the best gift in history this holiday season. Enjoy unlimited access to award-winning podcasts and thousands of hours of original history documentaries released weekly exclusively on History Hit. There are topics for all history lovers, from Pompeii to D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description for an exclusive discount. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to explore the past like never before with History Hit. Cretese is Georgia's second largest city, and according to the legend of Jason and the Argonauts, it was in Cretese that they found the Golden Fleece. My journey has brought me from the Black Sea deep into Georgian Transcaucasia. I'm about to head for the province of Svaneti, high in the Caucasus, following Jason's legendary trail. So the story goes, King Aertes hid the Golden Fleece somewhere here in an enchanted glade. But before Jason could take it, he had to face two challenges. The first was he had to defeat two fire-breathing bulls and then harness them to a plough. And the second was that he had to defeat the great serpent that guarded the fleece. Jason met both challenges, and as a reward, he not only got the fleece, but the king's daughter, Princess Medea, in marriage. That's what the myth says, and some of it is fact. To find out, I head further up the river into dangerous territory. And as if to make the point, just up the road is a checkpoint. United Nations troops keeping the lid on a territorial dispute. It's part of a long-running feud between Russia and Georgia. And while the troops are here as United Nations peacekeepers, they're hardly impartial. They're Russian. For centuries, Transcaucasian tribes have been at war with each other and we're going to visit one of them right now in Svaneti, home of the warrior Svans. So who were the Svans? Svans are Georgian. This is ethnic, small ethnic groups. And they live in high mountains for centuries. Nobody knows exactly when they moved to Svaneti and where from. The further we go, the more there are signs of danger. We pass a policeman guarding the road against bandits. Only a week ago, a traveller was kidnapped on this road. But there are other reasons why people come to grief in the Caucasus. So what are these on the side of the road? I've been seeing them all the way along. So just shrines uh, to people who had died. Sometimes they drink and uh, when they're drunk, so they drive. The so people who drive off the road and killed here. Yeah. Now I've seen a lot of roadside shrines, but this one has a particularly Georgian addition. This is vodka. So what's the vodka for? People, their relatives and friends, when they, they cross through, they drink to their remembrance. So we can just drink it? Yes, why not? And you, well, you raise a toast to? Usually they say a little God bless their souls. 
So what happens if um, people stop at all these different shrines and they drink and drink and drink and then they drive off the road? Yes, of course, and then <laughs> someone will make a shrine for them. In Georgia, alcohol is as much a way of life as it is a cause of death. So we, the living, will now toast the dead. OK. OK. So we don't know who we're drinking to. So to Please remember us, to this people. To remember us. To remember us. Oh. I don't know how anybody can get used to this stuff. Oh. I think it's very dangerous. <laughs> can you drive now? <laughs> this time I can, but maybe not after three or four more. <laughs> We're climbing higher into the mountains, and some of them are over 18,000 feet high. Finally, we reach Mestia in the Georgian province of Svaneti, where the Svans have lived in isolation for over 2,000 years. The Svans are famous for their dancing. First, the girls. As they sing, they glide over the ground like princesses in a medieval fairy story. The men also wear medieval costumes, and they've got attitudes to match. Theirs is a tradition of honour, chivalry and knights in armour. Until recently, some of them were still wearing chain mail. And this reputation goes back a long way. Over 2,000 years ago, the Greek geographer Strabo noted their warrior ways. But much of their fighting was done amongst themselves. Fosfaneti is a land of vendetta and revenge. All oh, the faces, it's incredible. Why is it all fenced off everywhere? So the family lots. Why do they keep them segregated? Because of vendettas. Really? Yes, it was tradition part of the life it's in Svaneti. Looking at their graves, you see that so many of them died so young. And if only it was for a more worthwhile cause. Trouble is, when you're so cut off from the outside world, small disputes can get out of hand. So what is the reason for the vendettas? Sometimes it's mm, woman or property, land. Sometimes very simple thing, like pig. Uh, and one of the vendettas started uh, in 1950 when pig crossed the border of neighbor's property. And uh, yes. And how long did that last for? It continues till um, they killed one guy from another family uh -huh. last year. <sighs> it's just something it's like Sicily. Yeah. Over the centuries, all this infighting had an amazing effect on the skyline. Rival Svan families built hundreds of towers, a sort of messier Manhattan. Into these, they could retreat if the vendettas got out of hand. So people lived in these all the time? Not all the time, just sometimes. When they had troubles with the neighbour families mm -hmm. or with other Caucasian tribes. So they stayed here. On first floor, there was someone on duty as guard. After the first line of defence, we head up to the food storage area. Imagine trying to haul goats, sheep and the, grain uh, bags up here. Made for smaller people than me. <laughs> <laughs> this fortress is over a thousand years old. Pull up the ladder and from here you could sit out a siege. So they would have covered up the holes with this? Yes. Further up again and we reach the family area. That's a long way up. <laughs> so this was a, a living room? Yes, probably this was a living room with four windows. But the most important part of all was right at the top, in the turret. Oh, wow. 
So this is where they spent most of their time? Yes, most of the time. It was more comfortable to stay here, to look out, to watch who is coming. It's really light and breezy up here. It's nice, isn't it? It's nice. So I guess you'd say this is the business end of these towers. They're really well constructed. This uh, wall over this portal actually prevents anything like arrows coming in, but you can drop anything you want through the bottom part. So boiling oil, excrement, arrows, even later on firing through them. And very little could come up. You sealed all the levels, and for weeks you could last up here with enough food. You probably wouldn't see out the vendetta, but you could probably last its worst times. But the Greek geographer Strabo, writing in the first century BC, noted another thing about the swans. They used a sheep's fleece to prospect for gold in nearby rivers. Could this be the place that gave rise to the Jason legend? Tomorrow I head even deeper into the Caucasus, where wild men ride like demons and the rivers run rich with gold. This is one of the world's great watersheds. Here the rivers in the Caucasus Mountains either run north into Europe or south into Asia Minor. For centuries in Georgian Transcaucasia, they've been gold prospecting in these rivers and streams. I'm leaving the Georgian border province of Svaneti and soon I'll make my way east along the Caucasus. But first, I want to find out the truth behind an ancient Greek myth. The village of Leli is high in the Caucasus Mountains. Ia brings me here because she thinks it's the best place to find a traditional Svaneti gold miner. This is gold prospecting village uh -huh. for a thousand years, maybe more. Nobody knows exactly. Well, is, there, is there any connection to, to Jason and the Golden Fleece? Yes, they still use this, um, all the traditions and fleece for, for, for obtaining gold. gold. They don't get many visitors up here, but Lely is a small village. Everyone knows everyone, and we're looking for a man called Gia. Gear is a local shepherd, but he comes from a long line of gold prospectors and he spends much of his spare time panning the nearby rivers. He knows this river well and it still yields gold, as he proves with a quick swirl of his pan. But I want to see the traditional method, the old-fashioned way they used to fleece for gold. At first, it looks like an ordinary sluice, but at the bottom is a sheepskin, a fleece. So if you place the sluice in a stream of fast-moving water and shovel in your slurry, in theory, the lighter gravel should be swept over it and away, while the heavier gold sinks and gets caught in the fleece. There's certainly gold in these rivers, and a few people know where to find it, but Gear's in no hurry to tell us where it is. I don't think we're going to get uh, that rich quickly, doing it this method, or at least with a, a sluice this size. But Gear, his father and his grandfather, have always done it this way, and they've, they've made enough to make a living. And it stands to reason that they've been doing that back through generations, perhaps all the way back to the time of Jason. So who knows, he could have really had a golden fleece. But this was only the start of Jason's legendary journey. He now had to take his golden fleece back to claim his throne. But according to one version of the myth, the Argonauts didn't go west, the direct route back to Greece. They went east towards the Caspian Sea. And east is where I too will go.
course, the myth makers had no idea of the topography. They didn't realize that Transcaucasia was a land of mountains and rivers flowing north and south, rather than east and west. But myth makers have never let the facts get in the way of a good story. We're now entering the province of Dusheti, in one of the remotest regions of the Caucasus. To get there, we must go by horse. And so they only stay here for the summer months and then they go down? Yes. In the wintertime, this is totally covered in snow. Yes, there's high snow in winter. Once more, I'm surrounded by Transcaucasian high-rise. All these towers are from 15th century. But these towers were built for a very different reason. They're signal towers to give advance warning of enemy raiders, the Chechens. The Chechen border is just over the range from here. The last time these towers were used in conflict was in 1928. Is taking me to meet a friend who lives with his family in a remote Tusheti Valley. In the summer months, Levin and his father run sheep and goats. We help push them up to higher ground. So Levin, you always ride without a saddle? He has some luggage uh, and he goes too far. In this case, he takes saddle. Uh -huh. But usually, he's riding without saddle. He looks like an American Indian. Yeah, it's like an American Indian. He rides the same. Like many who live here, Levan is a brilliant horseman. For Tushetians, good horsemanship is a matter of life and death. For centuries, Tushetian warriors have been chasing the Chechens away from their villages and flocks. Now they put their rough riding to more peaceful use. In a couple of days, there's a horse race, one of the wildest in the world. It's time for a celebration. At Levin's family home, everyone's making traditional Tusheti dumplings called pameni. There's a dinner on tonight, and we're invited. At any Georgian dinner, it pays to have a good head for alcohol. The toasts come thick and fast. We drink a toast of welcome, and then everybody's talking horses. Tell me, tell me about the horse and two settings. You're fantastic riders. Why, why, why are you such good riders on horses? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, was, I was born and grew up on the horse. But all, all Tushetians? Yeah, all Tushetian people. But they use them in war as well, the, the horse? Yeah. 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 Uh, most important thing in uh, Tushetian's life was horse as well um, during the fights. Yeah, yeah. Then it's more toasts. Australia's <laughs> Georgia and Australia. We're knocking back good Georgian wine. There's no escape. Every drink must be consumed to the bottom, and everyone is expected to remain in control of his faculties, because no Georgian party is complete without dancing. Georgian dancing seems to be led by the men. Then it's the women's turn. And I learned something else about Ia. She's a beautiful dancer. The following day, Levin wants to show us a rare and slightly grotesque piece of Tushetian history.
Not far from here are the quarantine vaults, where people came if bubonic plague or the Black Death swept through the valleys. It's really a do-it-yourself cemetery. No grave diggers, no undertakers, probably not even the last rites of the church. All you had to do was come here, crawl into your hole, and die. So people came up here to die when they had the plague? Yes, when? they isolated themselves. Do we know how old this body is, this person here? Uh, this person is about three centuries. Three centuries old. Each family, they had their own crypt, yes. like this, yes. And so the people would come up and bring them food? Yes, yeah, sometimes they bring, but uh, uh, if uh, it was really illness... They and just leave them? We are sure that they will not survive. In this case, they did it, bring. Sometimes mothers, they were coming with their cradles, with babies. They knew that if they were ill by plague, they would both die. Death has been a constant reality in the Caucasus, be it due to vendettas, Chechen raids, or bubonic plague. And as we listen to songs of sorrow, the fires atop the towers are burning. This time, not as a warning of enemy raids, but to summon the greatest horsemen in the land. Tomorrow's the great race, a real death or glory ride over rough terrain. And I intend to take part. Once a year in the Republic of Georgia, they descend from near and far on this remote valley high in the Caucasus. This is the race of the wild mountain horsemen of Tusheti, and it's said to be one of the roughest races in the world. As I cross the Caucasus, following in the footsteps of Jason and the Argonauts, I'm heading towards Azerbaijan and the Caspian Sea. But for the moment, I have a race to run. In an old pagan festival, they kill a ram and mount its head on a shrine. It's this that symbolizes the spirits of the valley. It's only eight o'clock in the morning, and already I'm beginning to wonder which spirits are being invoked, the valley or the vodka. Levin makes his own offering. He's one of the favourites and hopes the spirits look kindly on him. Just to make doubly sure, he lights candles under the watchful gaze of the ram. By now, it's 11 o'clock and the vodka spirits are really flowing, though it hasn't affected anyone's balance yet. Getting down seems a bigger challenge than getting up, and another glass of vodka's waiting at the bottom. Here they serve vodka in bulk. In a curious link with Jason, the prize is a fleece. We head for the starting line up the valley. Saddles are optional. And thank goodness I opted for the saddle. It rains. Not ideal conditions in this five mile free for all. This is horse racing at its wildest. Soon rain and grit take their toll.
rider falls a short distance from the line. Another falls almost on the line, if there's a line at all. The race just seems to peter out in the chaos where spectators and horses meet, sometimes rather violently. And who won? Well, that's a matter for debate, and probably still is. This father's certain his boy has won. Maybe he did. Whatever. He's the stuff of which legends are made. As for me, even with a saddle, I just wasn't in the running. Well, that was a pretty stonewall last. The problem was the uh, tie rope came off, but dangling behind the horse and I couldn't see it. That's not to say that I would have done any better if it hadn't been dragging along the ground. We did about five miles through that, through that sort of country. I can tell you, it's no wonder I came last. These guys are absolutely brilliant horsemen. With the rain pouring and the wine flowing, it's a long day of drinking, dancing and horse stories. And as evening approaches, they start the long ride home. Some, no doubt, to nurse hangovers all the way. Sadly, it's time to leave. Ia must return to her work in the city, and I must continue my journey east on Jason's trail. Our route takes us via the Georgian capital, Tbilisi, where Ia lives. castles, boulevards and orthodox churches has been the Georgian capital for 1,400 years. But it's a city with a turbulent history and nostalgia summons me to a place I'd been before, Parliament House, where as a young journalist I'd got my first scoop. This is not my first time in Georgia. Ten years ago, I was here at the time of one of the most important events in modern Georgian history, when the new president, Ziad Gamsakordia, declared independence from the crumbling Soviet empire. The crowd is unbelievably excited. Georgia, again, is a country and a republic. But the euphoria of independence was short-lived. Only eight months later, Georgia was embroiled in civil war. Eight years later, Georgia may be the poorer, but at least it's had some stability and independence. I'm now leaving Georgia and heading east towards the Caspian Sea. Ia agrees to come and see me off, on one condition, she drives. We reach the Azerbaijan border. 
And now it's time to say farewell to my companion and guide. Passport, please. Yeah, there's a visa there. Ia will return to Tbilisi and her normal life, while I head east and continue so my life of travel. Yes. Bus stop down there? Bus stop is nearby, not far. It's OK? Thank you. Thank you very much, huh? It's been fantastic. Okay. You have a safe trip, huh? Yes. And I'll call you from Baku. Okay. okay. Goodbye. Thanks, bye. Sadly, we say our goodbyes, but my journey must go on. Now I'm traveling on one of the world's oldest roads, the Silk Road. And I'm about to open the final chapter in my quest for Jason and the Argonauts. Five times a day, this mullah prepares to deliver the traditional Islamic call to prayer. He's a muzin in the Azerbaijan city of Sheki. And when the faithful hear his call, it's unassisted by loudspeakers or any electronic aid. Allah! This is the Asia Minor end of Transcaucasia, and the contrast between Christian Georgia and Islamic Azerbaijan couldn't be more marked. I'm now on the final leg of my journey from the Black Sea to the Caspian Sea, as I follow the spirit of Jason and the Argonauts. Once in Azerbaijan, it doesn't take long for the green of Georgia to give way to an arid landscape. That myth about Argonauts sailing down rivers is wearing thin. I see no rivers and very little water. Now, I'd heard of a mysterious mullah who lives like a hermit, who's supposed to give comfort to travellers. Language, nationality, faith, Harsh. none of it seems to be a problem. I'm a traveller, uh -huh. and I've come a long way. And, and he often so gets visits you. from non-Muslims. And I wonder if you could give me a prayer for my travels. I don't know if he understands a word of what I'm saying, but I receive my blessing. <laughs> And his message is simple. It doesn't matter what religion you are, the most important thing is to have a God and to have faith. If you carry your God in your heart, you'll be a good man. Amen. Now there's a familiar word, and it's common to Judaism, Christianity and Islam. And it means simply, so be it. And as if to rub it in, I get a series of thumps on my back with a stone. Then a flick of water and a small present. A stone wrapped in plastic. My good luck charm. I'm now heading down the road to Baku, and down the road, literally, because the closer I get to the Caspian Sea, the further below sea level I go. The Caspian is 90 feet below sea level. That's 27 metres. And on its shores, Baku, the oil-rich capital of Azerbaijan. For over a thousand years, this area's been known for its oil. Like cloth, Baku oil too was traded along the Silk Route. Oil for lamps, oil for embalming, and oil for anointing. It's said the oil that anointed Jesus Christ, 
may have come from here. Azerbaijanis are similar in a way to Iranians, but walking through Baku's streets, you'd never know it. If Iran's fundamentalist mullahs saw this, they'd be outraged. And it's not just Western decadence they'd object to. Decadent Islam is also here. And the belly dancers who used to gyrate their hips for sultans, khans and shahs now dance for the mafia mobsters who control much of Baku. And it's the oil that brings them here. They say that behind every oil rig lurks a mafia syndicate. But the oil rigs hide something even more vicious than the mafia. a mass of deadly vipers. A bite from one of these can deliver a lethal dose of venom. But here, there's value in venom. Viper venom is used to make heart disease drugs. It's also used as a coagulant for surgical operations. And they're very hard to see. These viper catchers have had their fair share of snake bites and have been collecting snakes for many years. Take a photograph? No, 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 no. To catch them, they've invented special tools. A long wand to hold the viper's head, and forceps to grab it from a safe distance. Then into the bag with it. After one viper bite, you've probably got eight hours. Oh, David, pass my three, pass my three. There's no way I'm getting close to one of these. Back at the laboratory, they milk them for venom. If ever there was an occupation that requires a steady hand, it's this. One gram of viper venom sells for 200 US dollars, which makes it more valuable even than gold. I seem to remember something about Jason wrestling with serpents. But to tell you the truth, I'd all but given up on the Jason myth until I visited the rocks of Gorbistan. All around me, is evidence of human habitation 10,000 years ago. Everywhere, there are rock carvings. Suddenly, I see an ancient sheep. Even more intriguingly, a ship. Could it have been the inspiration behind the myth? Maybe Jason did come this way in reality. So I'm back on his trail. I want to ride my own Argo out where the myth makers say Jason and his Argonauts sailed. Suddenly, the myth inspires me again. So if Jason were alive today, where would he have gone? What sort of person would he have been? He'd probably have been an oil billionaire. His gold pumped from below the Caspian. Black gold. The oil which runs world economies and still fuels the flames of belief. But truth is never as romantic as myth. And behind the myth of Jason and the Argonauts, was probably a real story. A story about a voyage of discovery. A story about a group of brave men who risked all to journey to the ends of the earth and returned 
to tell the tale.